Welcome to a special episode of Love You Like Crazy. Normally, my co-host Carrie and I talk about young adult books, but these special episodes contain discussions I had with people I talked to at Podex. One thing they have in common with our normal episodes is that they may contain spoilers for the books we talk about, and a few might contain the odd swear. With that understood, on to the episode! So now I'm talking to uh, Julie Shapiro, who is the executive producer of Radiotopia from PRX, as well as being an executive producer on the Ear Hustle podcast. Uh, you also have a zine named Anodyne. So what book would you like to talk about today? Well, I couldn't resist the opportunity to think more about the book Harriet the Spy, which, you know, when we first corresponded, I even said, does this even count as a YA novel? I'm not sure. I have an eight-year-old, almost eight-year-old. He's. We haven't gotten into the, the YA territory. So, um, But to me, I'm revisiting the book through his eyes and his brain. And it's just, it's come alive for me in a new way. Is this a book that you loved when you were yourself? I did. I loved the book. And uh, it was, I have two older sisters. So we had a copy of the book. Um, I even when I I still have the copy from my childhood and saw that uh, recently when I opened it up, there was a name in the front cover that wasn't our name. It was the daughter of my mom's best friend growing up, Sissy Curran. I'm going to memorialize her here. And I realized that it had been handed to our family from the Currans. And it just was something I shared with my sisters right away. And we all marveled about. Mm -hmm. So is there, well, how did... How do you feel like it struck you back then when you were young? Well, I remember just feeling like Harriet was this really strong sort of outlier. She's kind of, the story is about a girl who keeps a diary and writes mean things about her friends because she's very observant. She's got uh, rich parents who don't pay that much attention to her and a nanny who basically um, is her moral compass and quotes famous literature and sort of helps her see the world through a a non-traditional point of view. And uh, she she learns her lesson. Her friends find her notebooks and read all the mean things, well, mean or observant things, honest things she said about them. And she she figures out what friendship means and how to um, how to be honest and true to herself, but also interact with the world. And so they're pretty big ideas. And she's a non-standard hero. I think she's not, you know, she doesn't behave well. She's kind of um, obnoxious and unruly. And it's she's not the typical character you find in. And at least in kids' books, but I feel like some of the themes are so much older than just a kid's book. And it definitely reads as like a young teen book to me now. Mm -hmm. And then as an adult, do you read it differently? Well, uh, in between being young and an adult, or maybe (laughs) it was an older, a younger adult than I am now, I, when I was, uh, after college, I was actually in a, kind of crappy punk band in Portland, Oregon called Harriet the Spy. We fashioned oh. ourselves after the book, just like thinking of her as a strong female character. And we had all instrumental songs, but our lyrics would just be these journal entries from her book. So we had like a song that, you know, one time she wrote, when I look at him, I could eat a thousand tomato sandwiches. And we had a song that just started out with me like screaming that and then like beating on the drums. And, and we thought we were very artsy and good back then. But so I had a midlife appreciation for the book and then through my son have discovered it again. And like, I love it even more. I feel like it's more profound and sublime and bizarre and abstract and existential than I ever clued into as a kid, I think. Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, so I read it on the flight up. For the first time? No, I I read it as a kid also. Okay. Yeah, just as an adult, like, I mean, as an adult, sort of, you know, Harriet is obviously the main character and the center of everything. But you also see that the parents are kind of, you know, when the the nanny or or caretaker or whatever is fired or quits or or whatever, (laughs) she goes to get married, basically, and leaves the job. Um, and then the parents also kind of have to learn to be parents again. And that's also sort of there in the story, although perhaps not something you really recognize as a kid. Yeah. The, yeah. The parents transition, they shift a bit as well. So I took my son to see the play a couple of weeks ago, the Arlington children's theater was putting it on and there was this like dynamo of a young girl who played Harriet. And, um, and so that was my first like revisiting of it, but we had the book at home and then we decided to watch the movie as well. Cause Finn was really into the story and usually we would wait till the book was done, but 
we just had an empty night to watch. So I watched the movie. I hadn't seen the the remake of it as a movie. And now we're reading the book. So we have these three different versions of it. But I was like, I found the movie so moving, even though it's not a, it's not a great film, you know, but it, the story of the friendship between her and the nanny and the nanny going away, I, I was like brought in the play. I kind of cried my way through the play because it was just so amazing to see these young kids like taking on these huge problems and um, intricacies of humanity through through this story and the and and the acting was you know fine but just the whole the way they choreographed and brought her journal entries to life and so I'm sitting there tears kind of streaming down my face trying not to be noisy and Finn's just watching the play and he'd look over me every few minutes and sort of wonder why I was so affected but I think there's there's things you pick up on as an adult that are just so profound and as a parent totally profound now that I never would have clued into when I was younger. Mm -hmm. So do you think, like you talked about kind of the lesson of the story, um, which in the, let's see, what does Harriet say it is? Well, there's a whole thing about like, um, you know, that it's kind of okay to lie to make your friends feel better. I know. I don't know if I agree with this. The nanny's sort of like, well, sometimes you just have to tell little white lies. And it's not a great life lesson for kids. I mean, maybe there's some truth in it though. And then you have to think, well, maybe there is some truth to that. And how do you go through life being compassionate and nice? And where where is the danger in lying? And where is the support in, you know, helping people understand things a different way than you really think? Um, but yeah, I think there's a questionable mor moral of the story even, which makes me love the book even more because it doesn't, you can't just put it in the like, oh, it's like the lesson learn happily ever after category or, you know, redemption story. It's none of that. It's really like an outlier to all of those concepts. And, um, and it even has some parts that are like, you know, slightly, uh, anachronistic, shall we say, but could be slightly racist for people. I mean, it's just a sign of the times when it was written, I think, mm. in the 50s or 60s, and language was used differently. And so I had a couple cringe moments when I reread the book recently and thought, like, we'll I'll have to explain to Phineas why this isn't exactly the best way to say this or that about a character. And um, yeah, I think mm. there's it's problem. It's flawed in all these ways that make me love it a little bit more. Not necessarily the nearly racist stuff, but like the the kind of lesson you're not expecting that not every person would say is a great lesson of life. Yeah, I mean, I kind of like, I mean, there's, you know, Harriet learns lessons and things, but I kind of like that the lesson that she learned is not that you should stop spying on people yeah. because she keeps doing that to the end. It's more like, so how do we take this thing that you do and yeah. redirect it into being a journalist, I guess? Yeah, yeah. It's a budding journalist and also saying, yeah, this is a strength. This is a gift. Let's redirect it a bit. So it's, you know, something you could do with your life and, and do what you love. I mean, it's what she loves to do. And her, you know, she's surrounded by people trying to do what they love. Her one of her friends' sports father is a writer, and he's like a tortured artist, kind of. And you know, she's the people she spies on are all like versions of people kind of frustrated with their life. And I think there's a real sense of follow your heart a bit and do what you can to like parlay that into something that is good and helpful and contributive to people. Yeah. I mean, she goes on kind of a dark, she's on kind of a dark path for a while there. Like, it seems like it's going to end up with her intentionally, you know, premeditatedly breaking a kid's finger. Yeah. Um, she pulls back from that brink. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, man. There's also in the movie version quite a bit of like bullying. I mean, it's pretty yeah. harsh for the kids and, and in the book too, but like watching it with my son, it was really, we haven't gotten there yet in the book. And, and I was really struck by, um, you know, the spirit of kids. So it, it, there's like a, a authenticity about how kids actually act around each other and maybe should be forgiven for, but, you know, you kind of relive your own experiences with certain characters and in, in school and you can understand where some of those tensions were under the surface or on the surface or very clear between like group friend groups at school. Mm -hmm. So I know that there was, I think there was one sequel published in the author's lifetime and then maybe one um after her death yeah you're right i can picture it like the long summer or the long vacation or something yes i forget what it's called yeah i haven't dug back into that one yet it never struck me like harriet did mm. i think um really the first one was what stuck with me the image of her the copy that we had like the illustrations oh the illustrations in the book are beautiful too these like black and white line sketches and they're you know they're not very uh, they're sort of they're they're blurry. They're not, they're not, well, they're representational, but they're also a little bit wild. And I feel like that was true to the whole nature of the writing. 
there's a, there's a page where she's just for the school play. She has to be an onion, and she's just rolling around on the floor trying to like feel the onionness of an onion. And I I I like just marvel about the whole concept of that being a scene in the book, and like that challenge, and like I wonder what an onion feels like. And this is a tangent. You can cut it out of the podcast. But we we um, Radiotopia has a show called Everything Is Alive, which features interviews with inanimate objects. And I feel like this is basically a precursor to that show where she's like trying to get to the essence of being an onion. What's it like to be an onion? And it's just, it's just so strange and lovely. Yeah. And her father is like, her mother is kind of annoyed by it. And her father is like, yeah, let's, so what is being an onion like? It's uh, it's real. Yes, yeah. He's kind of sides with her in a funny way. I'm realizing he's, he's an ally in ways that mom steps in and, and disapproves of, but he's, he's, a, he's got a rascal side to him as well. Right. So this is, I feel like this is a really dumb question, but one that I'm compelled to ask nonetheless. So, you know, I mean, Harriet ends up writing the school newspaper, which is a trip. That newspaper is a trip. (laughs) Um, And so just, I mean, you are in journalism yourself at this point. So the dumb question is like, is there some sort of line between those two? Mm, Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think the writing and the carrying a book and the always being curious and being observant. I mean, it makes me think of two things. I had a social studies teacher, Mr. Versace in um, Cleveland, Ohio, and he had a mantra of be observant. And I've always thought back to how he was, he was like no other teacher, a little, a little intimidating and very smart and he was adored and sort of feared at the same time, but really remarkable person. And this idea of be observant, I've thought back a lot to how it's guided my entire kind of uh, profession and curation of audio and like wanting to hear the stories about life and certainly in doing my zine, uh, which is which is very participatory. So it's like invites other people to describe the world around them. And I think about that sort of, I've always been drawn to that sort of documenting and seeing and conveying conveyance that Harriet demonstrated through that. And then what is also very interesting to me, at least, and I think why Finn is so into Harriet the Spy as well, is we read another book that a friend lent to us, a graphic novel about middle schoolers, which felt a little old to me for him. But there was a newspaper club in the middle school. And after reading these two books in a series, Finn decided to start a neighborhood newspaper for our street. So oh. not just bragging about my kid, but I could really see I said, like, where did this idea come from? And he clearly was thinking about the, the club and the community at the newspaper club. And I think that's partly like what Harriet's doing. He's like t- tapping into that as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think like that connection, the book has really stuck with me and I've always admired her in a way. Mm-hmm. And so maybe there's, maybe there's some Harriet motivation and everything that happened since. I sure. first read it. Yeah, that's that's really cool. Um, so what would be the book you would bring to this conversation? So, yeah, so that's, uh, it would it would sort of depend on, on um, like, if I think about, because I sort of asked the question when I sent out the email in two different ways. One is, like, what's a book you remember from this time of your life? And then the other was, like, what's a book that you've read? Or what's a YA book that you've read any time mm-hmm. that you like? So if it was like this childhood book, there was this book, this will sound super pretentious probably, but um, there was a book called uh, Good Old Escher Bach, An Eternal Golden Braid by Douglas <laughs> Hofstadter. Um, and this was like my companion from surprisingly long, young until late high school, because when I was a kid, I could absolutely, obviously understand nothing of what they were talking about, but there were the, there were all these MC Escher pictures throughout it and some uh, Magritte yeah. as well. And I just loved those so much. And so I would just look through the book and look at those over and over. And then when I was a little older, there are these like, and it, there are sort of these very heady and intellectual chapters, but they're interspersed with these short dialogues between these characters of Achilles, a tortoise and some other people, um, which are written very humorously and just in a very engaging way. And I, so when I was a little older, I read those and really enjoyed those. Yeah. And then eventually, you know, just by, you know, you just, this book is like the size of a phone book, but eventually, you know, I, then I started reading the, the actual meat of the thing. And, um, the, you know, so it just really, I mean, it kind of sparked a life of, uh, Long, a lifetime love of mathematics with me, which oh wow, 
um, which was really great. Is uh, that what you're like you do? Are you a mathematician? Well, it's what I majored in, but uh, I'm I have a tech support job now, huh. and then I'm a musician, and then I. Oh, that's very mathematical, this, uh, actually. Music. Yeah, there's definitely. But then, like in terms of YA books, young adult books, um. Oh, there was a book. So, okay. Also, uh, maybe a better example of a book that is actually closer to the area of young adult fiction would be um, Madeline Langle. Oh. Uh, the movie came yeah, out. Yeah, right, right, right. Uh, a Wrinkle in Time. That's the one. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, A Wrinkle in Time was was uh, was a book that I read a lot as a kid as well. Yeah. And there's also sort of a yeah. mathematical angle to that. Yeah, in a definitely. Way. Does like Harry Potter count as YA? So, that, I think it does i think all of them would be considered ya now yeah. but i think when they came out when i th the first one or two came out i think maybe people would have thought of them more as, as kids book because the yeah. protagonist was so he young. was younger yeah um, yeah uh but there's a book um i just want to look it up so i get the title right um oh there's a book called when you reach me by rebecca stead hmm. um which takes place in new york uh and the main character of that um loves the Madeline Lango book um, and, you know, reads it to pieces. And it's just this story that has, it's short. It's like kind of, you know, similar to Harry, the spy in a little way. It's like kind of a story of someone figuring out that they don't have to be a jerk all the time, basically. <laughs> um, and they can actually, you know, they can help people. Uh, and I just loved it so much. And this is a book that I didn't read until I was an adult. My co-host Carrie picked it out and uh, it was just so wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a great book, I think. Yeah. Now that you've just sparked me to think about the fact that even the title Harriet the Spy, like spies are so, are seen as such negative influencers now. You know, there's such a nefarious uh, assumption along with the word spy. It was interesting to just subvert that a little bit. And I mean, she she was kind of, spying on people and it wasn't very nice but but as the protagonist as the hero it's like a something to champion a bit well it's kind of nice like at one point i mean she's so she's just observing obviously yeah. but like she there's this one guy who he she spies on through his skylight and he has his in, he's in a two-room apartment and one of the rooms is just filled Harrison with cats and withers i think is the same okay something like that and yeah. then at some point the health department raids him and takes all his cats away and he's very sad. And then at the end of book, towards the end of the book, she goes back and he has a kitten and, he, and it's just, uh, it's just, um, as a cat person, <laughs> I was like, Oh, he's got a cat. He's got a kitten now. It's really yeah. It's, touch, it's touching in some ways. You know, I thought, of, I just thought of another book that I've read a lot, totally different from Harry the Spy when I was more a teenager or YA, I guess mm. it was called the crumb. And it was by Jean Slaughter Doty who wrote a ton of these like, uh, stories about girls who rode horses and like the English style of jumping and horse showing. And I was very involved with that. And so I was like addicted to those books. And this one in particular was my sister. So, you know, I kind of grew up knowing that she was reading it, my older sisters. And um, and I, I read that way. I read that over and over year, for years. And the, the protagonist is sort of like the, the girl who's not the rich kid with the horses, but like works hard at the stable and is a you know skilled equestrian and competes against the, the you know, the rich kids that get their horses handed to them. And then like the spoiler alert, the, the, the main horse that she's obsessed with breaks a leg and, you know, there's, there's heartache, there's heartbreak, there's like underdog, un, you know, victory for the underdog, et cetera. And I loved that book a lot, actually. I can, like I can picture it. Mm -hmm. and I've, I've done the sort of like, whatever happens to that author and didn't get very far, but I think yeah. most horse, horse girls, but know the author and know some of her books. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had a, uh, a friend who was thinking about starting a podcast about horse books. Yeah. Oh, just about horse. She's like, and I'll have an expert in everyone, which is an actual <laughs> young girl. Yeah. And I was That's like, great. I will, I would listen to that yeah. podcast so much. Yeah. Um, I made a, a documentary about competitive model horse collecting because there is a whole world of horse shows that, that people have the models go to with their models oh, yeah. to compete. It's amazing. Yeah. And you mentioned like picturing the book. Like yeah. I, I kind of wonder, you know, cause eBooks are, such a thing now yeah like a lot of the people that i've talked to for this have they've mentioned the cover as something oh, yeah. that they just remember yeah. you know and yeah. to tie uh, my story together oh, yeah. harriet became a centerfold for my zine way back when oh. where each centerfold had like a, a like a woman icon um in color the 
zine is black and white, but the centerfold would be color. And, and one of them is like, uh, it's horizontal, but yeah, it's, you, you rotate it. It's just that the cover of the book and my favorite quote from the book under that. All caps. All the journal entries are all caps too. So yeah, it's yeah. A very visual. It's a very visually fun book to read. And um, in fact, in the play version, the way they brought the journal entries to life was they had three girls dressed as composition books that would follow Harriet around. And whenever she was pretending to write, the girls would say the lines. Oh. So it was very clever. My son was so confused. He's like, <laughs> are those girls in the play? I don't understand. Wait, what are the girls in black about again? We had to talk about it three or four times. And I realized like, yeah, this is this is like experimental theater for a kid, right? Like to mm. to understand that they represent the journal entries. They are not actual characters in the play. They're not Harriet's best friends following her around. It was, re- it was really interesting. So I gave you a very short introduction at the beginning, but is there mm. anything in particular that you want to talk about? In- people who listen to this maybe should look into? Oh, um, well, I love all the shows in our network, Radiotopia. They're largely storytelling podcasts that are highly produced and there's a lot of attention to detail and sound. And I think they're quite original shows. So they're not as much conversations. They're really like innovative approaches to storytelling about all kinds of things. There, there's topics, um, you know, about everything really, but uh, there's 17 shows. So I would encourage any, everyone to look into those. And um, I do do a zine. My zine still, as you mentioned, anodyne, and it is participatory. So if anyone is interested in uh, participating, which means I send you a piece of mail that you that you respond to through the mail and send it back, and then you're part of the zine. And people who contribute actually get a paper version in the mail because it also speaks to my love of mail, getting mail, sending mail, packaging mail, opening mail. So yeah, I would welcome anyone to, um, you can uh, find me on Twitter at at J Atomic, like J Atomic, J-A-T-O-M-I-C. And let me know you want to participate and I'd be happy to send you some mail. DM me your address and I'll do that. Excellent. Um, well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Sure. My pleasure. I really, I really appreciate it. I, I've enjoyed this discussion very much. Yeah, me too. Thanks for asking. Give me a call when you get back. Hey there. Hey. Love, I like crazy.com.